A very good evening to all of you. Uh, let me extend a very warm welcome to all the participants, uh, all students, parents, uh, faculty members, colleagues from uh, uh, OP Jindal Global University and, and all the others. Uh, I'm very excited uh, to welcome our distinguished speakers. Uh, Mr. Damodran, uh, of course, has joined us today. Uh, he's, uh, he's an inspiration for thousands of students uh, and practitioners in the banking finance industries and even beyond that. Um, it's, uh, we are, we'll be joined by our uh, second speaker very soon. Um, but more importantly, this is really the end of a very, very hectic week uh, for all of you, uh, especially for you, Mr. Damodran. I'm very, very glad that you could join us. Uh, I'm quite happy that uh, our Vice Chancellor, Professor Rajkumar, could also join us in this very important launch event. I know he was just speaking in another panel discussion a few minutes ago, uh, and he switched to a new Zoom meeting. So thanks, Raj. Uh, your energy is incredible, and you might, I know, join another meeting just after this. So thank you very much for joining. Uh, now, in a world uh, without this COVID pandemic, this uh, launch event uh, would have taken place very differently, but uh, we have the same level of excitement uh, and a sense of accomplishment. Uh, let me tell you very briefly um, uh, about the school. Uh, my name is Ashish Bhardwaj. I'm the Dean of the Jindal School of Banking and Finance at OP Jindal Global University. The school was established in 2018 with a very clear, crystal clear vision of bringing about some formidable changes in our banking, finance, and financial services industry. Uh, it's more important now as we uh, you know, navigate through all kinds of uh, problems. You have to navigate through this thicket of uh, a health crisis and its financial and economic implications, but also the, the social and technological, legal, regulatory challenges that, uh, uh, that have come our way. Uh, as, a, as a role model of institutional excellence in social sciences, uh, our university, OP Jindal Global University, offers interdisciplinary education with a very, very global orientation, active promotion of research in several areas of social sciences, arts, and humanities, including banking, finance, and entrepreneurship. Now, based on this overarching framework, the vision of the School of Banking and Finance is to evolve as an institution that focuses on new technology-led banking, finance, and allied fields to develop professionals who are aware of environmental, ethical, and even development issues in finance that are of local and global relevance. Our two programs, uh, the undergraduate BCom Honors Program and the very recently launched uh, MBA Program in Digital Finance and Banking uh, in collaboration with uh, the General Global Business School are really built and structured around this vision. And now on this day, I'm delighted that, uh, that we've taken one more step forward in this direction by launching uh, what we think is a truly unique and a very, very hands-on undergraduate program in the area of finance and entrepreneurship. The program is uh, de designed uh, collaboratively to support lifelong learning by combining uh, not just the traditional uh, hallmark skills and tools of social sciences and finance in particular, but also with very practical and adaptable skills uh, of finance, uh, financial, computational, and entrepreneurial nature. Uh, this is uh, uh, one of the first, uh, uh, perhaps the, the first program, uh, undergraduate degree program, uh, exclusively on finance and entrepreneurship uh, in India, which is offered by our banking and finance school, uh, which is really meant to help students understand uh, and create new ideas, new products, new services, not just in financial technologies, but also in this vast digital finance field and the banking uh, industry, which is undergoing uh, so much of digitization and changes. Uh, we have two distinguished speakers, as I said, uh, who will share their views on, on, on uh, finance and entrepreneurship and the intersection. Uh, I want to stick to the agenda, but before that, I'd like to invite uh, the founding vice chancellor of OP Jindal Global University, Professor Raj Kumar, to inaugurate the event and move forward. Raj, over to you. Thank you very much, Ashish. Uh, first of all, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you uh, to this very special occasion. Uh, we have developed a culture within the university uh, in which whenever we launch a new academic program, 
we launch it as a part of an intellectually engaged event uh, in the form of a lecture or a conference. And today we are very, very delighted that we have an extraordinary person, a truly inspiring individual in uh, Mr. Damodaran, uh, who, uh, who had kindly agreed to deliver a keynote address at the launch of this new academic uh, program called the Bachelor of Arts Honors in uh, Finance and Entrepreneurship uh, at the Jindal School of Banking and Finance. Now, of course, Mr. Damodaran has had a very distinguished career uh, in it quite rarely uh, that a person has uh, straddled across so many worlds. Um, you know, as a young probationary officer, he worked in the Indian Bank and State Bank of India. Then he uh, joined the Indian Administrative Service uh, in the year 1971 and rose uh, to become the Chief Secretary of the uh, State of Tripura uh, in 1992. Uh, he became the youngest person ever in India to hold uh, the position of the Chief Secretary of a state government. Later, he became the Chairman of UTI uh, and, of course, later the Chairman of SEBI. And, of course, since he left uh, demitted office, uh, he has also held many other positions of responsibility. Uh, he was uh, elected in SEBI as the Chairman of the Emerging Markets Committee. Uh, he was also the Chairman of the Ministry of Corporate Affairs Committee for reforming the regulatory environment, for facilitating the ease of doing business in India. He was Chairman of the Reserve Bank of India's Committee on Customer Service in Banks. He chaired the Task Force on Corporate Governance, constituted by the FICI. And of course, later, he was also appointed as uh, the Chairman of Indigo. Uh, he has sat and worked very closely uh, in a number of uh, uh, boards, and that's a part of his uh, extraordinary responsibility, including being a director of the boards of Larson and Tubro, Hero, Hero Motor Corp, Tech Mahindra, uh, Chrysler, Biocon, Experian India, and many other uh, fascinating initiatives. So we are very, very fortunate that we have with us Mr. Damodaran, who has kindly accepted to deliver the keynote address. Um, let me quickly introduce the university itself. OP Jindal Global University was created in the year 2009 as a philanthropic initiative of our founding chancellor and benefactor, Mr. Naveen Jindal. And one of the important aspects of that vision was to build a world-class university in India. We are a multidisciplinary university. Um, just to trace its early origins, we began in a very modest manner with only one school and little over 100 students and little over 10 faculty members in 2009. In the last 11 years, we have significantly expanded our university uh, and we have moved from, say, 100 students to 6,600 students, from 10 faculty members to over 700 full-time faculty members, from one school to 10 schools in law, business, international press, public policy, liberal arts, journalism, architecture, banking and finance, environment and sustainability. And just a few days ago, we established the 10th school of the university, the Jindal School of Psychology and Counseling. This expansion and evolution has kept in mind our deep and pervasive commitment towards quality and excellence. That has culminated in the Jindal Global University receiving a number of recognitions, including the NAC accreditation, giving us the highest NAC A grade as far as Indian institutions are concerned. We've also been, uh, we have broken into the QS BRICS rankings to be one of the top 350 universities in BRICS, top 400 in Asia, and also most recently top 700 in the world, India's first private university uh, first ranked private university as far as QS world university rankings are concerned. Uh, one of the more, uh, let's say, special recognitions that we are very proud of is the fact that we have been more recently declared as an institution of eminence by the government of India. As some of you know, it has been the initiative of our honorable prime minister to promote the idea of recognizing 10 public and 10 private universities among uh, the thousand plus Indian universities and recognize them to be institutions of eminence and help them propel to become world-class universities in the years to come. Uh, that's our short history. We are nimble, young, uh, hopefully uh, dynamic, and in that process created new schools and programs that are constantly uh, innovating and contributing towards our commitment in promoting excellence. 
this program that is being launched today is part of our effort to address a challenge that prevails in our st broader studies relating to banking and finance which is to have a sharper focus on finance and entrepreneurship as a young country with over 850 million people who are less than 35 years of age when most parts of the western world and eastern world will become younger uh, older and india will be younger and that young india needs to be not only educated but also empowered and that empowerment needs to have new ways of promoting innovation and entrepreneurship we sincerely hope that the launch of this program at the jindal school of banking and finance uh, augurs well for our effort to promote a culture of entrepreneurship in india that will also create opportunities for social innovation as well as promoting different aspects of uh, finance into it uh, in fact ashish talked about the other program that we launched several months ago which is the masters in business administration in blended learning mode uh, with upgrad and that focuses on digital finance and banking uh, all of this is part of an effort to create opportunities for young people at different levels uh, to be able to take the study of banking and finance far more seriously and have a far more far greater focus in the academic and intellectual imagination of the study of banking and finance with those words let me once again extend a warm welcome uh, to all of you and indeed to our distinguished uh, guest uh, mr damodaran i know that we will be soon well welcoming uh, our other speaker uh, as well and as she joins we'll talk more about it thank you very much thanks raj for those uh, for those remarks uh, i'd like to now invite uh, mr damodaran to deliver his keynote address uh, on the future of finance and entrepreneurship in india mr damodaran over to you thank you professor bhardwaj and thank you professor raj kumar it's an extraordinary privilege to be with you today when you're launching yet another initiative in the life of a relatively young university even as i heard you mention all the areas that the university has got into by way of setting up new schools uh, specializations that are different from those that are offered by your conventional universities i was thinking to myself that it is easier to list the areas where you haven't got into uh much easier and perhaps if we have this conversation 2 3 years later maybe that list will be a very small list it's a phenomenal journey that you have uh, undertaken so far you have i think identified india's needs because most of our traditional institutions were producing unidimensional creatures if i may call it that people who worked in silos learned in silos uh, were taught in silos and therefore couldn't relate to what was outside their silos and therefore persons that saw the linkages between separate disciplines and who therefore became persons that genuinely benefited from a multidisciplinary university they are the kind of people that you have in your fold and i dare say that uh, if they haven't realized the difference if they haven't realized that it's not just a distinction it's a difference that uh, sets your university apart under your dynamic leadership uh, professor rajkumar uh i have uh, from the distance applauded as you ventured into newer areas conquered newer play fields uh planted your flags in the right places so that people recognize that india too has a university that has flexibility that recognizes that persons need to know more need to be taught or need to have experience and knowledge shared with them in a manner 
that they are able to absorb and that they are able to utilize going forward. It's phenomenal. Uh, I think uh, Professor Bharadwaj had uh, maybe thought that I was living an easy life and therefore he set before me the challenging task of sharing some thoughts on the future of finance and entrepreneurship. Talking about the future is dangerous. It is it's not courageous, it's foolhardy today, especially after what COVID did to us, caught us by surprise, both in terms of the short notice arrival, as well as the effect that it has had on our work, our lives, the way we go about uh, our daily chores. Alongside uh, COVID, you got climate change that is something that uh, maybe one president has not taken seriously, but the rest of the world is beginning to see that this is a very major challenge for humankind. Then you have the expansionist tendencies of some countries that want to conquer physical space. And alongside that, interestingly, you have economic nationalism when the emerging markets put up uh, barriers, whether they were tariff barriers or non-tariff barriers, they were called protectionism. When the Western world did that, it was called economic nationalism. Much the same thing, just difference in labeling. But that is a challenge because people are now looking inwards. There are barriers to free trade that exist. Then there is rightly an increased focus on ESG. ESG 10 years ago was not on anyone's active vocabulary. Today you have investors who are telling companies, I've looked at your numbers, I've looked at your performance, I've done my due diligence on everything that I need to do, but tell us where you are in the ESG space, what is it that you have done, what is it that you intend to do, and how are you going to get there, and how quickly are you going to get there. That is a challenge. It is in that context that I am venturing to look at the future of financing. With all these changes around us, what is finance going to look like is certainly a challenge. In the olden days, the good old days, as some people like to call it, life was much simpler. If you take banking, for example, we went to buildings that housed banks. We stood in queues, filled out forms, either deposited money or withdrew money. If you're influential enough, you could have a conversation with the branch manager. Uh, life was lived at a leisurely pace. Today, no one goes to bank branches. Bank branches have shrunk in size and in number. You don't need so many of them. Years ago, there was a conversation that we are going to move to branchless banking, and we got there. Just to give one example, sometime in the mid 70s or perhaps the late 70s, some banks got together and undertook an exercise on what is it that customers find deficient by way of customer service. And more than 50% of the complaints that came in were on the time taken for collection of outstation checks. When the same, same exercise was done towards the turn of the century, 60% was on, on trans, ATM transactions that had failed. So the bank customer had changed unrecognizably, if you will. The products had changed. There were more products. The pace at which transactions were being put through was mind-boggling from the leisurely pace that we had in the olden times. And then there was talk of not just branchless banking, but bankless banking. Do you need banks for banking? I mean, if you rewind to the origins of banking, you had a somewhat well-built person wearing a double-breasted suit, uh, so well-built that you recognized he couldn't run away with your money, and you entrusted him the money uh, for safekeeping and paid him some money for it. Life has moved on. When I was a probationary officer, uh, how many years ago was that? 1969-70. Uh, more than half a century ago, I went to somebody and said, look, I need to learn how to do this. The simple formula suggested to me was, turn the page and learn the work. Just go back to what was there before. That's all that you need to know. Today, if somebody 
tells that to a junior colleague, he would need to have his head examined because no, no uh, work is learned by turning the pages. Life has moved on. Unfortunately, of course, nobody has the time to tell you and you're very much on your own. You're thrown at the deep end of the pool. If you survive, you survive. Otherwise, bad luck. You're one more uh, number in the list of people that failed. There were times when to get a bank loan, it was said that you needed to wear your best clothes and go to the bank because if you were not well-dressed and if you didn't look affluent, the banker wouldn't give you a loan. And it was all collateral-based banking in any case. If you didn't have collateral, it didn't matter how good your idea was, you wouldn't get money from a bank. Today, you don't go to the bank. The banker comes after you saying, if you are credible, if you have a proposal, he is telling you, and you have choices. You don't need to go to a bank to get money. You can go to several other places to get money. The other major change that has taken place alongside this is our concept of money. I remember reading in my old economics textbook, and I remember that only because it rhymed, that money is a matter of functions for a medium, a measure, a standard, and a store. Is that what we have today? I'm not so sure. Today, with cryptocurrency having come in, uh, not welcome in some jurisdictions, regrettably in my view, because whether you like it or not, it will be upon us in a much larger way sooner rather than later. Many countries have recognized that truth, have accepted it, embraced it. Um, we are taking time. I think we are a little more conservative. Our Reserve Bank, for example, said it shouldn't be permitted. Of course, the Supreme Court uh, has said that, look at it, put in place what restrictions you need, what safeguards you need to put in place. But you can't say, sorry, I am saying that this is illegal and you can't take that. Cryptocurrency is something that will be upon us as you go forward. There is no question about it. If you move from banking to the securities market space, think of a time when persons that raised money in the market had very simple explanations for what they intended to do with the money. The issuers of capital, the intermediaries, and the investors were all on the same page. There was what lawyers call consensus ad item. They all understood the same thing. Today, even the understanding is different. Somebody is saying something about a product. 2008, we saw that playing out in the United States where products were launched that most people didn't have an idea of but bought into nevertheless because they didn't want to miss an opportunity. Regulators certainly were behind the curve. They clearly didn't understand what was happening in the backyard and therefore the whole thing blew up in our face. Uh, a lot of institutions failed. Uh, Lehman Brothers unfortunately took the name uh, for the failure. Everything is explained in terms of September 15th and the blow up of the Lehman Brothers. Products have got complicated in the securities markets. I remember a conversation about, not now, but about 15 years ago with the regulator of the French securities market, a very learned gentleman had been in that business for a while in the business of regulation. Uh, no, not like India where before you learn the work, it's time to go and somebody else comes in. Been there for years. He said he was going to recruit 100 PhDs in mathematics for the securities regulator of France. And when he was asked why, he said, my existing guys don't understand the products. There's far too much mathematics and modeling in it. And therefore, if we are to regulate, we need to understand what we are regulating. So I'm going to the top universities and getting all these PhDs in maths. The world has moved on. Today, we don't have the products that we had earlier, even our Indian markets. Badla was a very important product to the Indian market. You don't hear Badla being mentioned in Bombay any longer. Uh, you have uh, other products in the f and segment. You don't have Badlas. Maybe variations on the same theme as musicians call it, but uh, perhaps something that uh, we need to understand. So every area of finance is undergoing very significant change. 
the nature of interaction, the products, the players in the market, the nature of regulation, the problem that regulators face to address two issues, namely the conflict of interest and the asymmetry of information, which are the two major problems in most markets. Some people are acting because the conflict of interest generates something extra for them. Some people have information before the others. They have better information. They have more detailed information. And therefore, they're able to convert that into financial gains. You cannot have orderly markets going forward with that kind of a thing. And so regulators are also playing catch up, tightening the screws on those that are stepping out of line. But at the same time, hopefully, trying to simplify the regulation so that business carries on. Somewhere we need to recognize, and this is something that we're missing out, that all of this constitutes a means to an end. The end is to enable business to be carried on in a manner that's consistent with the interests of all stakeholders. You have, I must say, a beautiful combination of uh, finance and entrepreneurship that you are looking at. Because what is entrepreneurship? Entrepreneurship is risk taking and the major risks are in the area of finance. So if you don't understand both of these together, clearly you are uh, getting into an area where you don't know whether there is an exit route available. There is, is there some way that I can figure out what I need to do if my moves get wrong? I need to know them up front. I need to anticipate, not respond. I've always believed as an old chess player that the ones who succeed in life are the ones who play the white pieces, not the black pieces. I know several grandmasters have major victories with black pieces, but it's when you make the first moves, and this is the difference I tell people and young people ought to know this between compliance and governance. Compliance is playing black pieces, responding to what the regulator tells you. Governance is playing white pieces, doing the right things because you think that's the right thing to do. Do the right thing at the right time for the right reasons and in the right manner. That is all that there is to it. Now, if you look at what entrepreneurs need, and I'm reminded of the year in which Sri Lanka won the World Cup many, many moons ago, beating Australia in the finals, completely unanticipated result. Arjuna Ranatunga was leading the uh, Sri Lankan team, and he was a very generously built man not the fit types that today you see on the IPL field, not that. Uh, his his uh, waistline had clearly uh, gone to a stage when it was not indicative of sports person. It didn't prevent him from being nimble, it didn't prevent him from being in the right place at the right time. Uh, he could anticipate, but when he won, and the Australians, one of them summoned the courage, having lost, to go up to him and say, look, uh, you know, looking at you, we don't get the impression that uh, you can actually play and win a cricket match. And what he said then is something that has resonated with me uh, ever since I heard it first. He said, it is not the size of your stomach that's important. It's the fire in the belly that's important. And that is what entrepreneurship is about. It is about something that is gnawing inside you. And an entrepreneur is one who doesn't want to partake of an existing cake. He's a creator. He's somebody who is adding value. In our country, of course, we don't uh, look on those that add value uh, as well as we ought to. We tend to be critical of them. I'm coming to that in less than a minute. But entrepreneurs are luckily for us, not job seekers. They're providers of jobs. And I think given the large number of young people that are in the workforce, there must be a large number that set out to provide for those who don't have the fire in the belly, who may be a hardworking, disciplined, industrious, whatever, but don't have that spark that makes them take the risk, identify the opportunity, see what it takes to put together the ideas, reach out to people who've been there, done that, and then chart your own course. That is something that we need to encourage. And if you are doing it at the undergrad level, there could be nothing better. 
because I think that is a stage when young people start dreaming. When you move, your course will move them from a dream to a vision. Because that is the journey that they need to undertake. A dream informed by knowledge will translate to a vision. And that is the combination that you're providing for these students. In the future, five years, 10 years from now, you will have a lot of people doing things that we could never imagine when we were young. We didn't think these opportunities existed. When I was a young man just getting out of my pre-university, there were only two choices that you had. You either went to medical college or you went to engineering college. There was no third choice. Uh, regrettably, law was at that point of time not seen. During uh, freedom struggle, law was a great profession. And then somewhere legal education fell along the way and uh, uh, it was not considered of, at the same level. Chartered accountancy had not reached that level yet. And so there was only law, there was only medicine and engineering. I opted for engineering. I went for two years to IIT Madras, dropped out there. I discovered that I was not fit to be an engineer or didn't have what it took, and then went into economics and other subjects and strayed into the public sector thereafter. But I think the ability to choose to take decisions, the courage of conviction, the confidence, the commitment, the conceptual clarity, if all of that package is not helped to be shaped, all of these reside in some measure in young people. If we don't shape that, give them the fuel that drives it on the way forward. Today, we are talking about a handful of unicorns. I think we will reach a stage, and I'm very optimistic, sooner rather than later, as to use an old expression that if you throw a stone, you will hit more than one unicorn form. Uh, we will, if you go to Koramangala and Bangalore and look at the number of uh, potential unicorns that are sitting there. In fact, when young people speak to me, I tell them, don't buy a house or rent a house. Rent a garage. That is where the best ideas come from. And if you rent a garage and you stay there, subject yourself to the limitations of space, etc., that hunger will drive you to do what you need to do. And along with the inputs that you provide by way of a rigorous kind of academic training, <coughs> I believe young India in larger numbers will be ready to shoulder the responsibilities of entrepreneurship, wealth creation, adding to what the nation needs at this point of time in diverse areas and making us a far more confident nation, a nation that belongs right at the top. I think you have what it takes to get more and more people there and I wish you the very best as you launch this new program. I thought when I heard about this from Professor Ashish Bharadwaj the first time after an initial conversation with the Vice Chancellor, uh, I said, if only I had the benefit of such a course, uh, uh, maybe what, 55 years ago, 56 years ago, I would have been perhaps a more rounded person. I might have created wealth rather than being a job seeker. Thank you very much. It's a privilege and an opportunity to share some thoughts with, with people who are the India of tomorrow. I want to add one important thing. Thank you, Mr. Damodaran, for such an inspiring speech. Uh, speaking about doctors and engineers, I grew up in Chennai, and uh, it's a city where most people who are serious about doing anything should aspire to become a doctor, and if not, an engineer. And at that time, when my relatives came to know that I'm going to, I want to be a lawyer. They all turned up at my home unannounced and were trying to engage with my parents. And after a you know, period of say 40, maybe 10, 15 minutes of silence, my uncle asked my father, because they came to know that I'm going to study law. He said, what happened to Raj? He was a good student. And then the, the other uncle said that I knew he was not good enough to become a doctor but I thought he will at least become an engineer. And then the third aunt said, you know, doctors and engineers, you need to be smart and responsible and intelligent and everything, but he was not cut for it. But we thought he might at least become a chartered accountant. Why law? <laughs> that, was the, that was Chennai 
30 years ago a lot has changed but you're absolutely right uh, the evolution in careers and perspectives among young people has gone through a tectonic shift in which uh, career choices have dramatically been reimagined so thank you so much mr damodaran for that fascinating uh, you know uh, keynote address Uh, so, thank you very much i i completely agree it was uh, it was such a uh, you know thought provoking address thanks very much mr damodran we we still have about uh, you know 5 minutes left before i can invite our other speaker mr renu sathi i have a question uh, that some students want uh, you to address for them uh, there are some of them are asking uh, how do you think this uh, crisis will be remembered or written in our uh, books in years to come is it going to be remembered as a problem of credit or a problem of connectivity a problem of sheer confusion or a problem of lack of courage a uh, short answer all of the above oh, okay uh, slightly, we have time for a long answer also slightly long answer is that i think if you fast forward 20 25 30 years from now when the students that you will send out of your universities post their uh, course will be in early middle age let's say uh, or maybe late young age whatever i think they will remember it as a time when the whole country the whole world was taken under this they will then want to remember which of the countries that having been taken under this got their act together reasonably quickly put in place the building blocks of the resistance found solutions had a plan b and a plan c if plan a didn't work out right at the end of the day the winners are those who have plan b and plan c not the guys that think plan a will work definitely uh, and countries that do that institutions from do that just take one challenge work from home if you if you look at what was happening in march i know a lot of uh, corporate entities had very serious problems in relocating most of the workforce to home you had to suddenly acquire a whole lot of computers for example they were not having those in the houses uh, those that were working on desktops in the offices needed to be given laptops at home uh, the shops had shut because no shops were available goods that were manufactured in one city were not moving to another because there was no transportation that was available and yet you needed to do all of that now look at what is happening now you don't hear this mentioned as a problem everybody is got this put in place now you're hearing the other problem how long is it that we are going to work out of home my very dear friend cp gurnani the managing director of tech mahindra on whose board i sit CP had a blog the other day where he said, "I am waiting for the old normal." He said, "I want to see more people in the offices, people that I can talk to, people that I can relate with, people with whom I have co-created things in this company. Where are they? They are just two-dimensional on the screens. I want to see the third dimension." the touch the feel everything is gone up to a point of time the two dimensional presence uh, on the screen is good enough i think we will remember this as a major crisis which also created opportunities concurrently which some took advantage of some failed to take advantage of i have if i have one more minute let me expand on this please when god created human kind and this is my belief when god created human kind he created us with three sets of faculties if you look at plants plants have growth if you look at animals animals have growth and instinct human kind is growth instinct and reason in fact it was milton who first said of growth instinct and reason all defined in man but because we are his allegedly we don't have proof yet we are his best creations he also gave us the best challenges because in a sense he's challenging himself 
Have I created guys that can solve problems that I'm set for? And if you look at what happens in the old birthday parties, I haven't attended one recently, where you have a game called the treasure hunt. There was a treasure hidden somewhere. The task was to go and find it. So God's approach to humankind has been that. He will create problems for us, but he will leave the solution somewhere. You better make the effort to go and find those solutions. Those of us who are handling this crisis with that approach, with the treasure hunt approach, there is a solution somewhere that I will find it. Sooner rather than later, we'll reach that solution. And at the end of the day, it is tough situation, which I, I am a very, very gender neutral person. But this is best explained, unfortunately, in a gender specific sense. This is a situation which will tell the men apart from the boys. You, you will be able to see who are those that have what it takes to stare a challenge in the face, stare it down, overcome it. If we don't have that, if we shy away, if we turn our tails, if we believe that turning our back on a problem, the problem can't see us, the problem is seeing us all right. We are not seeing the problem when we turn our back on it. I hope that uh, we will remember this as a great opportunity which came cloaked as a great problem. Thank you very much, Mr. Damodaran. Thank you. So, uh, you know, I would like to thank Mr. Damodaran for a very inspiring, uh, you know, keynote address. I, I think we at JGU uh, definitely share his his, uh, you know, idea of many more unicorns uh, in India, I think, you know, that will be uh, one major ways in which we as a country achieve our long and short term strategic objectives. So on that note, uh, you know, I would also like to welcome uh, Ms. Renu Sati, who's the senior vice president at PTM. Uh, and I would like to invite her to deliver her special address on how digital payments can benefit entrepreneurs in India. Uh, Ms. Renu Sati, over to you, please. Thank you so much, uh, Ashi. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Ashish. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Rajkumar. Thank you so much, Mayank. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ram. Uh, Ramacharan and, and thank you so much, uh, Mr. Damodaran. It is my so much privilege to share the stage with you. And, and I was talking to somebody and I was telling that, you know, I'm going to share the stage with sir because I've been following you since the UTI days. So I think the Unit Trust of India happened and after that, uh, the, you know, the UTI bank happened and the Axis Bank and then the SEBI also. So I have been following, uh, you know, you on th those days. So it is, it's so much of my privilege to be here and talking with you. Uh, so I actually was, I have prepared one brief, uh, you know, presentation, but now I am feeling that presentation is not required, but uh, let me still kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, give a, you know, just a snapshot, uh, you know, and I can just talk about it. I hope my presentation is visible to all of you. I will not, uh, you know, kind of uh, take all slides, but uh, maybe uh, one or two slides, which I can just take you through. And I also, you know, kind of wanted to share how India is actually is getting the benefit of the whole digital payments uh, era. And what are the key drivers for this? You know, so if you see the numbers, you know, in 2015, it was only 3% uh, the transaction which was happening in the digital mode. But, uh, you know, um, but if I talk about 2025, I we are hoping, and I think that is the projection which are coming, that 31% transaction is going to be in the form of the digital. And, and what happened, you know, what happened last five days, you know, five years, and what will happen in the next five years. So some of the key drivers are definitely the kind of internet users India has, you know, that in 2015, there was only 300 million users. Now we are, we are sitting at a 695 million users, especially on the smartphone penetration. It was only 240 million, uh, you know, uh, customers who were carrying a smartphone. And now there's going to be, a, there is right now close to 500 million customers who have a smartphone and smartphone is actually, it's, it's a very, very powerful gadget, which we all have, you know, we can consume the content on it. We can do a financial transaction on the you know with our, with our with our mobile phone we can you know consume the content and, and we can do a shopping also you know so everything what you can believe as a lifestyle you can everything can be done from the uh, smartphone so that is i think india is in that in that uh, you know spree of you know adopting the whole digital as well as whole smartphone and, and and then let's just talk about the digital payments what happened in the digital payments in 2015 it was only uh, 50 million customers who were actually availing the benefit of the digital payments but in the current year you know there are 2 
200 million customer who are using the digital payment, which is like a very, very big number. Now, another important number, which actually uh, coming from the projection and the survey, which is done by, you know, the consulting firms that in next five years, it's going to be almost, you know, more than a double. So from a 200 million customer, it will now be going to be a 750 million customer, you know, for the, you know, our, uh, you know, you can say the population will start using the digital payment. And that is the huge number, you know, out of 1.3 million population, we have a 800 million, uh, you know, the, uh, the population will be completely on the digital era. Uh, so that is, you know, a very, very, you know, important key driver for us, uh, everybody to get into this uh, digital era. Uh, let's just talk about how is the merchant side is, you know, working. So when, uh, you know, 2015, it was only 2 million merchants, which were actually accepting the payments. 2020, we have now 20, even in Paytm itself, you know, and, and uh, we have 17 million merchants who are actually accepting payments uh, via, you know, with Paytm. And altogether, there are 25 million merchants. And, and we believe that in next 25, in next five years more, it's going to be 50 million merchants who will be accepting payments. So from a merchant side, from a business side, from a consumer side, everybody right now is, you know, driving and getting into that digital era because people are getting benefit, you know, out of it. Uh, now, let me just... Uh, so this is one of my favorite slides, which I was telling, you know, uh, everybody, you know, as a customer, and I believe that all of us who are in this call right now and the people who are watching also, they all are Paytm customer. So, you know, this is actually just a life cycle of, an, of a customer that, you know, you wake up in the morning, you want to pay for your, you know, milk, you can pay, you know, with the, you know, with your Paytm wallet or any other digital you know, platform, you want to take a taxi, you can pay via, you know, Paytm, you actually are availing the toll and you're going via toll that you actually have a fast tag, which is again linked with your wallet, you actually have, so, you know, what this picture is actually showcasing that, you know, whatever you want to do in the day, whether it is going to be making a payment in the form of, you know, you know, um, making a payment you want to invest in the wealth or you want to actually save you know in terms of any banking transaction everything can be done by the digital or the digital payments and that is how actually india is now getting into the form of and, and i think the good part is it's not only our generation our you know the previous generation has also started accepting the digital you know payments and the future generation is definitely is into a digital you know mode uh, and considering that I've been in, associated with Paytm, I've been there in this company for the last 14 years, what Paytm has played a very, very big role. Uh, and I can proudly say that in this whole digital new revolution, uh, one side, we have all the uh, use cases for the customers, you know, like I mentioned that all, what, what all a customer can do through Paytm, similarly for the merchants also. So we have the online payment solution for the, you know, the online website, we have actually offline, I'm sure you have seen the QR code, which is there, then we also are coming up with more financial services you know that we have a bank also now there will be insurance services also and the lending services also and the content also so you can even book a you know the you know the ticketing and you can even go for a bus ticket also movie ticket also everything can happen on the so how i see paytm is one side it's a payment then it's a commerce and then it's a financial services so you know the paytm is actually giving all those solution services to our customer to our merchants to everybody and that is where it has really played a big role to you know to, as a part of the digital you know revolution so that is the thing and the considering that i really have to you know touch upon how this digital era is helping the entrepreneurs and I think I really like, sir, what you said that, you know, uh, you know, in the earlier era, unless until you are actually coming with a good, uh, you know, tie and a shirt, you know, banker will not even attend you and, he, you know, you will not be getting a loan. But now because of the whole digital transactions or, you know, so digital transaction helps an you know, entrepreneur or any small businesses also that he can create uh, the history of his transaction. And on the basis of that, he will be eligible for uh, all those financial services, you know, option, which he was not available. That is one. Secondly, he can do a much more management you know so he can pay his you know people's salary through the you know uh, the, the banking services he can actually connect with his supplier as well as his uh, you know consumer also completely aligned and then use the digital payments in between he can also so earlier i just to give an example if i have to if a merchant has to open a shop and if the shop is an indoor he would only be expecting that i have a shop and it's only indoor maybe within five kilometers ten kilometers people will be coming and give you know buying from me but look at this now that because of this whole digital payments 
or not only digital payments, but the whole ecosystem got created. One, it's a digital payment, then it's a whole delivery services which has come in the place, then it's the e-commerce which has come in the place. If I have to club all together, a shopkeeper will open one shop and will sort out his whole supply chain, and then he will actually kind of open his store on the Paytm, he will open his store on maybe Flipkart, he will open a store on Zomato, you know, if it's a you know food delivery, and then with just sitting in one shop, uh, you know, he will be able to cater from Indore to even to a, you know the Kanyakumari to a Delhi to Agra to everybody. So all that could happen because of the kind of infrastructure you know the you know our country able to provide to uh, to the entrepreneurs. So so that is where actually a very very big role with the digital era plays for the entrepreneur to you know the further involved into that uh, you know stage. Secondly, like I talked about that you know you are sitting you know with one shop you are able to now deliver to all across uh, you know country. Uh, so that is what it is. Secondly, what uh, you know, I, I already talked about that. You know, if now you have a credit history and you have a financial services, uh, uh, you have a you know a transaction coming via digital mode. You can go and you know attend the. You can take the loan also uh, from the financial services institution. So that is uh, the thing. And another very very important part. And because I wanted to close conclude the this presentation, the government has played a very very big role to drive the whole digital in our country. One definitely. Was a demonetization time because before that, uh, you know, and and still we are a very very cash economic uh, cash you know driven economy, but from three percent. To coming now in the range of that you know it was a three percent transaction happening in the 2015 and and I'm believing that now it is in the range of 20 percent transaction or 25 percent transaction and in five percent and in next five years going to be 31 percent transaction which will be completely digital uh, and government the kind of our reforms and the kind of our initiative government has built up and driving that is also playing a very very big role for you know driving this whole entrepreneurship so I think it is the right time right opportunity for uh, for all the students and or for all the upcoming generation. To start leveraging these, these uh, you know, all these, you know, the the platform which is coming for them, all these initiative which is coming for them, uh, and, and so so that's uh, from my side. So so thank you so much. Yeah, that's about it. Thank you. So let me just stop the presentation now. But can I, sorry, Mayank, uh, if I can uh, quickly ask the same yes, question before we can move into the Q&A round. Um, thanks very much, Renu, for that, uh, for those thoughts. Uh, uh, there was a question that uh, uh, I'd asked to Mr. Damodaran, and I wish to get your thoughts on the same, because uh, you presented a very different side of uh, how things have evolved. How do you think this crisis is going to be remembered in decades to come? a problem of credit, connectivity, or a delightful silver lining that completely changed the fortune of a company that's uh, into digital payments and technology that much. What are your thoughts? Yeah. So, Ashish, let me kind of uh, make a, you know, uh, uh, I, I think, and I truly believe that, and I think most of us believe that India is a country which believes in surviving, or which, which actually, uh, you know, survive and then thrive also. And I think with this whole situation, we will definitely come out with much more opportunities for our people, you know, and people have started thinking. And, and I know I'm talking to some people and, and the peop there are people who are actually right now working in a, a, a very comfortably placed in a company and doing a decent uh, role. Uh, you know, with a you know the kind of a compensation also they get, but they start coming out upfront and they saying, "Ki this is a time for me to plunge into the entrepreneurship. This is a time for me to do something bigger. You know, this is a time maybe I will be able to solve some problem because this situation has created so many problem. So I am sure there's an answer and solution also. So you know, so it's like you know, I see that you know, I know this is a situation where we every country and all of us are struggling with, and we will be coming out soon out of this. But this will definitely be you know giving us many more opportunities for the people who really want to build something and try to you know solve problem and, and we've seen that you know uh, and that you know that economy has started coming back now so so that is what i would say it is definitely going to be creating more opportunities versus you know that oh what happened or, or what will happen so that is what i truly believe so it will be so it will be remembered as the phase where a lot of opportunities were created for people so never, never let a uh, good, what is it called? Good crisis go waste, that approach. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Renu. That was uh, absolutely wonderful. Um, so now we, we're going to, we have about 15 minutes uh, for Q&A. Um, and I'm going to, there are lots of questions and comments coming in. I might uh, uh, kind of bring two comments together 
to pose them as a question. Uh, the first one is uh, slightly broad, so I'll request Mr. Damodaran to perhaps respond to it first. The question is that uh, the data is suggesting that our economy was really on a decline even before this COVID-induced chaos started. Uh, now, considering this, do you think that the primacy is going to be on uh, fiscal policy measures for allocating money that the government may not entirely have? or it's going to be on uh, a monetary policy uh, measure uh, to infuse money in the banking system, which is already fragile and fatigued, uh, so to say, or is, it, uh, is there another way to handle this? What are your thoughts, sir? That's a very interesting question. Uh, you know, the problem of lives and livelihoods, that is the one that we've grappled with over the last six months. Do you look after the lives of people because there is a health crisis? Do you open up the economy in order to ensure that the livelihoods of people are protected? And can both of these run parallel? Maybe in retrospect, not that I'm finding fault with anyone. It's very easy to have the benefit of hindsight and make observations. But uh, if I net that out of my thought process, in hindsight, we might have fallen between two stools somewhere along the way. But having fallen, I think the sign of a courageous person or an institution is when you fall down, you get up, you dust your pants, and you continue the good fight. Right? So I think we were a little unclear when to open up, how much to open up. Uh, will that impact lives more seriously? Uh, you know, the fatality rates were uh, at one stage threatening to get out of hand. So given all of that and your first comment, the economy was already in decline before COVID came. Uh, unfortunately, some persons, not in government, but outside of government, for all the ills, they seem to be blaming COVID. They were in any case, irrespective of the arrival of COVID, not going down a very happy path. They, they were having problems that they were grappling with. COVID came in not as an explanation, but as an excuse for many of them. I, I think we need to remember that there is only so much that monetary policy can do. I know that the governor RBI a few months ago did make a statement. We will do whatever it takes. Whatever it takes was the, the philosophy of the central bank. Whatever it takes might mean opening up making more liquidity available, uh, persuading the banks uh, to start lending instead of you know, uh, playing safe, not lending, holding on to money. I think the central bank has done most of what it can do. Uh, there is only that much space available in the monetary policy segment. And even the latest policy, if you notice, he has sparked inflationary concerns and uh, looked at what can be done for growth, because growth is critical. Uh, fiscal policy is where you ought to see more action. And if you look at what some of the other countries have done, the programs that they have announced in terms of the percentage of GDP is more than ours. If you critically analyze what we announced, you will find that most of that is taking on board what already exists in the budget, taking on board what banks are expected to do, and then you need to persuade them. And then to address temporary liquidity measures, just to give you one example, if you reduce the provident fund deduction from 12% to 10% for a period of three months, uh, so what does it mean? Nothing much really. It's only that for three months, you're leaving more money in my hands, but the problem will catch, with, catch up with me afterwards. Postponement, deferment, etc., are not issues. I think the fact that, uh, you know, as Renu mentioned, that the economy is starting to look up. We, we are not hurtling down. One month ago, when the finance minister said, and the chief economic advisor said, I'm seeing green shoots, a lot of people were very critical. Where are the green shoots? Uh, today, there are actually green shoots. There are 
sectors in which you are seeing near pre-COVID level activity and growth. There are some sectors which clearly will take time to catch up. It's also a function of demand. What is it that India is demanding at this stage? And whether the supplies are adequate, are the supplies appropriate? Adequacy is one thing. Are, are they appropriate? Have the demands changed in terms of what products are required, etc.? I think we are in for better times. Are we in for good times uh, in the short run? Not so sure. But certainly things are getting better. The direction is right. But you need to loosen your purse strings. I don't think we can indefinitely get into arguments that are inconclusive, looking at what rating agencies will say if your deficit gets out of hand. Rating agencies live in this world. They don't live in another world. Yes, they have a job to do. They will obviously flag things that don't look right to them. I sit on the board of a rating agency, so I can tell you this. But it's not that rating agencies are completely oblivious of what is happening in the world outside. And if rating agency is the constituency that you're looking at, you won't find solutions. You need to do what you think is right. You need to do as much as is adequate and appropriate for the problem today. Small doses delivered late will only accentuate the problem. Uh, I'll give you one example I'm fond of giving. If there are scholarship schemes and scholarships reach the households or the students, educational scholarships, three, four months after the fees has to be paid, the fees would have been paid by doing whatever and the money that is then received from government sources will go into conspicuous consumption which was not on their plate, but suddenly money came. You don't need to apply it to what it was meant for. You will get those kinds of absurdities creeping in if the timeliness of your assistance is not something. See, even if you look at something like credit for agriculture, there is adequacy, there is availability, there is timeliness. You have to address all of these. So this is really a time for courage, a time for fiscal policy to stand up and deliver. Hello. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Damodran, for that wonderful uh, uh, comment on the question. In fact, this, uh, the response will resonate uh, with the one uh, question which was asked earlier, how will the crisis be remembered? And one of the terms there was courage, because if there's a problem of uh, lack of trust, or uh, uh, you know, people not uh, being get, being courageous to take certain bold decisions, and they are fearful of them, and it will certainly affect the way we'll bounce back. It will affect the way we'll uh, Just one get things. Comment, if I may. Please go future, ahead, sir. The future is about trust, transparency, and technology. And if you don't have trust, you're not even getting started. So. Uh, I'll, I'll just take, take the Q&A round forward on that note. The future is uh, about trust, transparency, and technology. I want to come to uh, Renu now. Uh, uh, of course, building on these three factors, which are pretty much uh, the parameters that are going to decide the future, uh, there has been an acceleration in uh, digital payments in India that has helped thousands of people uh, across the country, across income segments, uh, a question to you, Renu, is do you think it is easier for businesses, particularly those uh, that are at a younger uh, stage or startups, is it easy for them to enter the fintech or this digital space now than before? Or do you think there is some kind of saturation in the market we are seeing? Uh, so, uh, like I said, uh, you know, Ashish, there are multiple opportunities available, you know, uh, we are actually, we have just started, I think I would that way. And like Sir said, you know, I think the T, uh, three T's now, the trust uh, and the transparency and the technology, I think we are right now uh, at the right time, right, uh, you know, um, the, the, every ingredient is right right now for us, you know. So this, this is going to be another opportunity. So I think there was a time when the manufacturing was, you know, in, you know, you know on the 
the higher side and then there's you know the next uh, you know thing came and and uh, now this whole digital era so digital era i would say it just started you know there will be a multiple opportunity for so many people so many entrepreneurs you know to come forward and try to solve a problem of each and every aspect of our you know um, you know our our, our life Uh, so it, i would say there will be multiple opportunity coming you know along with this whole revolution which is happening in in our country not only in the fintech space but otherwise also overall you know and this whole atmanirbhar you know the initiative which government has started with that also people know that you know there are so you know if you want you know if somebody has a courage and there are you know risk you know taking a risk uh, I, i i think there's so many other things available for him or her to take that uh, you know plunge so right this is the right time for anybody who wants to get into this entrepreneurship setting up his own business because there's infrastructure available there is a you know uh, in the government you know initiatives are driving uh, you know the banks are actually also participating so there are you know the pillars and the the the, uh, the foundation which is being created for our future generation also to come forward and and make many more you know such startup and entrepreneurs and the unicorns which will be coming soon and try to solve the problem so yeah Th- thank you renu just a quick uh, question which uh, came to my mind uh, as you were responding to this one and then i'm going to pass it to my colleague mayank who has a, a question in mind you said that it's really about courage and uh, uh, the determination to do something um, and and that's that's going to be uh, uh, the future outlook but that that really uh, uh, raises the question is courage really enough because in some ways a lot of uh, Uh, uh senior thinkers and scholars are saying that this is this is in many ways a problem of credit and access to credit access to timely credit so once you've taken a decision to start something in whatever space digital uh, or otherwise then you need access to credit in difficult times like these uh, which is kind of hard to come as mr damodaran was saying it's important to lose uh, you know purse strings so my question is which any one of you can uh, uh, respond uh is it how can uh, you know doing business when we say uh particularly for banks how can this doing business be genuinely eased because the the entire sector is under uh, distress so what are your views on uh, when the government tries to intervene in terms of regulations and trying to create a meaningful environment Uh, where banks can uh, thrive and 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 credit can be uh, made available on time to the right people given the current state of the economy and the sector because that ties up very well with what renu was saying courage needs to be complemented with credit to make good things happen what are your thoughts sir me oh hi yeah. okay you spoke about courage yes courage on the part of bankers is going to help not just courage on the part of entrepreneurs those that seek credit must seek it with confidence those that make credit available must make it available with courage and conviction now how do you do this you do this because you have to put in place important far reaching solutions the standard response of the banking regulator has been over the years regulatory forbearance don't apply some provisions kick the, that is kicking the can down the road it will catch up with you sooner rather than later it will address today's problems multiply day after tomorrow's problems no question about it what you need to do now is firstly and when you look at public sector banks and also private sector banks nowadays firstly learn to distinguish between a bona fide error of judgment and a decision that is ab initio malafide bankers take decisions what is banking banking is dealing in risk once upon a time one of the finance ministers said that bankers are risk averse i told him that you are contradicting yourself banking is dealing in risk you are either a banker or you are risk averse you can't be both right so you have to deal in risk you have to understand the risk and then you have to ride over that now the issue is that if you are with the benefit of hindsight going to hold people accountable for decisions which were then correct but turned out to be wrong nobody gets 100 out of 100 in decision making but you require people to take 100 decisions out of 
what has happened is that the system has over time, and it's not a function of last 5, 10, 15 years. Over time, the system has tended to punish errors of commission and to ignore errors of omission. So there is safety in not doing anything. And since I am in the presence of a distinguished uh, uh, jurist and lawyer, I have had occasion to tell people that an act includes an omission to act. You are punishing me for an act. Why are you not punishing the other guy for not doing anything? He's in the system sitting somewhere because he's obliged to take decisions. If we don't encourage that, if you don't have what I call the tripod model for organizations, you know, the thing about a tripod is all the three legs must be equally long and equally strong. Otherwise, the tripod won't be steady. So the first leg is empowerment. Have you empowered the bankers? You haven't. You're second guessing the decisions. Have you incentivized them to exercise those powers? You haven't. Have you defined accountability, which is the third leg of the tripod, in a manner in which Bonafide errors judgment will not lead to somebody being hauled up and uh, regretting a decision for the rest of his or her life. If we don't import that courage into the banking sector, you're not going to see much lending, notwithstanding exhortations from Delhi or Bombay or from anybody else. If that happens, credit will flow because there's no other problem. There are there are people, you see, bankers are now in a very odd situation. They are getting requests for credit, but those are from people to whom they would rather not lend. The people that actually want to set up projects have credible track records are not going to bankers. Why? Firstly, credit is expensive here. There are easier ways of raising money, less costly ways if you go outside. If your instruments are right, you issue papers which are... <laughs> triple A or double A plus, you can raise money abroad that is much cheaper than you can borrow in the Indian markets. Make it worthwhile for bankers to lend. That is important. If that doesn't happen, too many other things will not happen because credit has to flow. Yes, there are NPAs, but there are solutions. If you will permit me a personal observation, when I took over the chairmanship of IDBI, the non-performing assets were, just hold on to your chairs, 39%, 39%. What did we do? We said, there is no conventional solution to this. There's just no way. You got to think out of the box. You have to find some solution outside your books. So we created a stressed asset stabilization fund, moved the assets to that fund, got government to finance the fund, not IDBI, and that took the assets of IDBI's books and the fund would then dispose of the assets and come back to uh, IDBI saying, okay, we have disposed of these assets. It was a win-win-win situation for everybody. No money went out of the government because they issued 20-year bonds on which there was no annual payments and they could roll over the bonds after 20 years. It's not yet 20 years and I believe half the money or more than half has been recovered. But We've heard a talk about a bad bank for how long? It's been talked about so long. I am not talking about one big bad bank. Create an institution specific bank, which is like the SASF that we created for IDBI, and then move your non-performing assets there and then see whether the horse will run, it will run. With empowerment, with incentivization and accountability, it will run. I'm hopeful. Thank you very much uh, for those remarks. Mayank, over to you. I know you have uh, yeah, you have a question. So please go ahead. Right. Thank you very much, Ashish. I have a question for Reno. And, you know, uh, uh, this question concerns a lot of startups. Uh, you know, as we see that, you know, in the specifically in the Indian context, we've seen that, you know, uh, there is an issue of cash burn and to acquire customers, uh, and I think this is also true for Paytm to a large extent uh, that, you know, the, these companies are burning a lot of cash to acquire customers. So they're growing very rapidly, but so are the losses. And I'm, I'm just wondering, what is the sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, thinking at Paytm? What do you think 
uh, you know, even in the context of PTM, how long can this continue and how to get out of this spiral? Okay. So I was actually waiting that somebody would put this question <laughs> because in every discussion or meeting, you know, I, this question will come in one or the other form. So, uh, so Meng, let me answer the question. You know, let me not use a word of burn. Let me use a word of, you know, spending money to create that ecosystem. You know, somebody has to do that. Somebody has to do that investment. So whether, you know, and I, we are talking right now, you said in the Paytm context, yeah, I think you're right that we've been, uh, you know, uh, investing money, I would say to acquire a customer so that that customer or that business will become habitual to the way, you know, the whole digital payments work. And so uh, it's not a cash burn. It is primarily that investing to make sure that he become comfortable we start understanding this is convenient there's a trust the transaction flows happen conveniently i get the money next day though i am actually paying nothing to pay uh, but so it is primarily to investing a money to create an ecosystem that is one part second part how and when ktm will make a money you know that's again the right question see it's, it's it's actually a stages you know so one you actually invest the money to create that ecosystem second you create another product you know you create another product which wherein you know definitely uh, whether customer will pay you for availing a services or even a merchant will pay you the, you know availing the services so let me take an example of that you know while i know for a customer you know when the customer is buying for for payment customer is not paying anything to us but when a customer is you know consuming some other services let me say that you know buying a book ticket buying a bus ticket from paytm or let's say when he's buying, uh, you know, uh, you know, a streamer ticket from us, there is definitely something which we are making money, you know, so the money is coming, not from a payment, but maybe giving a top of services to that. Similarly, if I talk about, you know, the, on the payment on the merchant side, the merchants is not giving a payment, you know, any money to me when he's processing a payment with Paytm, but he will eventually will give me a money when I'll give you a much more than that. If I will tell him that, you know, why don't you avail some other services, which I have actually created specially for you, it could be a loyalty services, then he will give it, give the money to me and then we will make a money and then come the financial services. Now, you know, in the future or in the current scheme of things also, there will be other solutions which will be in the form of, you know, the banking service in the form of, uh, you know, the insurance in the form of lending, there we will make a money or, or anybody who's kind of burning the cash will make a money. So it's about not burning, it's about investing, creating a new ecosystem and then giving more services where you know the you know we will be able to make money that's all. thank you thank you very much renu for that you know um, great explanation for that you know lingering question that comes to mind uh, especially in the indian context of startups uh, i would like to thank mr damodran and uh, ms renu for for a wonderful wonderful session i think you know i can say on behalf of everyone here that you know we've gained a lot uh, by just listening to to you even for a brief time uh, i'll just you know give a short introduction of the uh, philosophy behind this uh, ba owners finance and entrepreneurship uh, uh, you know, uh, in this session. So, you know, this program of BA Honors Finance and Entrepreneurship has been conceptualized to address the large and growing need for graduates with not only a deep knowledge and understanding of the domains of finance, banking, and allied areas, uh, but also with the skills to start and successfully manage their own ventures. So BA Honors Finance and Entrepreneurship is a very hands-on and experiential program which aims to contribute towards making India the entrepreneurial hub of the world. As we all are aware, although India has lately seen a lot of activity in the startup space with many new ventures attracting sizable valuations and funding, we still lag far behind compared to countries like US and China. Uh, as per reports, India has about 22 unicorns uh, compared to about 230 each uh, in US and China. Uh, now, interestingly, in this list of 22 Indian unicorns, Paytm with the highest valuation and Razorpay, uh, the latest unicorn to join the list, are both in the fintech space. In fact, uh, roughly 50% of the unicorns in India are in the e-commerce and the fintech space. Now, this clearly indicates not only the potential of the e-commerce and fintech space, but also the need for many more feasible and viable ideas to take birth and grow. With a population base of about 1.35 billion on course to becoming the most populous country in the world, India needs many more successful startups for a variety of strategic reasons, including creating the required quality and quantity of jobs uh, to tap into a massive demographic dividend, uh, but also meeting the government of India's strategic objective of creating a $5 trillion uh, economy. This BA Honours Finance and Entrepreneurship Program from OP Jindal Global University, uh, uh, India's, of course, number one private university, is India's first undergraduate degree program in finance and entrepreneurship and is an initiative 
to provide a top quality, experiential, and skills-based undergraduate program to transform high school students into world-class leaders and entrepreneurs, especially in the BFSI space. So we have carefully woven together uh, the syllabus uh, and the curriculum of this program to make sure that we not only give uh, you know, cutting edge uh, courses uh, uh, in, the, in the domains of finance, entrepreneurship, technology, uh, but also you know, give the students intensive workshops to give them the skill set to manage and start their own companies. Uh, so, you know, that is, the, that is the philosophy behind this undergraduate program. Uh, we totally share Mr. Damodaran's view that India needs many more unicorns in order to, you know, uh, achieve its long and short, -term, uh, short and long term strategic objectives. So on that note, uh, I would like to invite uh, my, my colleague, Professor Ram Chandran, for the concluding remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayank. And... Uh... Uh, truly appreciate the very wise and kind words from uh, Mr. Damodaran and uh, Mr. Renu Sati. Um, so you can think of uh, JSBF as a garage at this point in time. And what we plan to do is to create courageous students. Uh, and we plan to teach them how to trust themselves in terms of building confidence in themselves to take risks and so that they can create uh, whatever that comes to their imagination. We expect and uh, uh, anticipate that our students are going to take the necessary responsibility, both from social impact perspective, as well as in terms of governance and ethical standpoint. And so the transparency with which they operate uh, is uh, meaningful across the board. And we also uh, plan and uh, surely will be touching our technology. Uh, be it in terms of uh, use of artificial intelligence and in, uh, financial services, or in terms of use of uh, other techniques like cognitive prosthetics and uh, uh, IOTs and uh, uh, blockchain. Uh, those are all integral to the kind of program that we have uh, thought to. So the ultimate outcome is that our students are going to not only give a run for the money to the traditional banking systems and the bankless uh, institutions or the internet only banks, but also to the likes of Paytm. So we anticipate that um, we, our students are going to create those unicorns uh, in, in a way that is going to build on top of what Paytm and Razorpay and others have done, uh, but actually magnify it exponentially. Like one of the other entrepreneurs uh, in, uh, had indicated, India does not need 30,000 uh, entrepreneurs and 30,000 uh, startup companies. We need 6 million uh, entrepreneurs, right? And that is what uh, uh, JSBF is planning to do. And uh, our goal is to ensure that the vision that we envisage is uh, going to be realized in the next few years. And I agree with both of you in terms of saying that the current uh, crisis is an opportunity for everybody to think very differently and uh, provide those opportunities for our young minds. Uh, if you look back at uh, 2008, uh, that was a time and during the financial crisis, we had the Ubers and the Airbnbs and the cryptocurrency Bitcoins all come into play. And this is going to do just exactly that in terms of if you look back in the, the next five years, you'll say what an amazing change and uh, transformation that has happened. In, in the world today. And so uh, to thank you again, uh, Mr. Damodaran and Mr. Renu Sati. It was an absolutely a great uh, exercise uh, uh, for, for, I mean, the, the learnings from you in the last, in the very short period of time. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Pro Professor Rajkumar uh, for being the kind visionary and uh, imaginative leader that he has always been and a friend to our school and uh, appreciate all your time. And I also want to thank uh, Ashish. I know he wants to say something. I, I will uh, let him have his word, but then I want to thank uh, Professor Ashish as well and all the support staff and the faculty and the people who have joined us today. Uh, Ashish, uh, you want to have yeah. your final say. Thanks, Ram. Thanks very much. It, uh, it really summarized uh, the conversation we had today uh, and what the speakers had to say. Since we have uh, about three minutes left, I thought I'll uh, exploit this opportunity. Uh, one, I want to mention that, uh, you know, my colleague Mayank, uh, I don't know if we were able to uh, introduce him. He's a, a professor uh, of strategy and he's vice dean of outreach and promotion uh, for the banking and finance school. And he's been instrumental 
in uh, helping us create this program along with uh, other colleagues, uh, Adam is here and so many others who are listening on YouTube. Now on behalf of the students uh, who are going to be joining this program, I have a rapid fire question and I would really appreciate a 30 to 60 second response from both Mr. Damodra and Ms. Renu. Um, and I'm asking this because you've, you've, you've built institutions, big and small, you've mentored, inspired several people, you've recruited several people. So if there's one advice that you can give to students who will be, who will be studying finance and banking in a hopefully post-COVID India or post-COVID world, what would that advice be? You want to go first? Please go ahead, sir. Okay. No, it's short. It is not so much for while they are students, but when they step out into the world outside, it's very simple. Don't fear failure. If you fear failure, you won't even know what success looks like. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much, sir. Renu. So, uh, you know, I think sir has also already said that, you know, just a different word from, from my side, don't give up. You know, if you're actually plunging into, uh, you know, startup, you're getting into entrepreneurship, you know, this don't give up has to be, you have to keep talking about yourself with this word. Because the moment you start thinking that I made a mistake and I have to go back, there is where you're making a mistake. And, but if you keep going, keep going, I think there it will be a differentiator because, you know, because you don't know when you are actually, re you know, reaching to a stage and realizing it is a time for me give up just the next, you know, maybe a, you, you're just closer to your milestone. So my advice to everyone Everybody who's getting into the startup mode that don't give up, you know, and, and keep going and keep, you know, keep uh, go and keep, keep thinking that why you even started, you know, if you know that why you started and you, you know, keep working towards that, I'm sure everybody will reach with the right, you know, attitude, right hard work, uh, you know, so don't give up is a word from my side for every person who's getting into this entrepreneurship. Thank you so much. Uh... Uh, this was. Uh, this is really what uh, a lot of our students who are listening now and who are going to be listening uh, in the next few weeks and months would be really delighted to hear. Thanks so much for your time. I'm going to pass it on to. Uh, uh, sorry, Ram. I I just hijacked uh, your segment, but no. uh, but, no, but that really brings us to the uh, to the to, to the closure of this uh, fantastic event. Uh, Raj, any thoughts? Any views? Well, thank you so much. And I think it's really a great beginning. And we couldn't have had a better start of the launch of the BA in finance and entrepreneurship. Thank you so much, Mr. Damodaran. And thank you very much, uh, Ms. Sati. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank Congratulations, you. Ashish, Mayank, and Ram, and others. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you. you.